everyone. My name is Chuck Betters, and I'm coming to you from the Help and Hope podcast. This is a ministry of Mark Inc. Ministries, and our goal is to do just that, is to bring help and hope to those who are hurting. And that's why I'm really excited today to have with us Darby Strickland. Welcome, Darby. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. It's great to have you, and Darby has done so much for those who have suffered with trauma. She is a faculty member at the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation in PA. It's also known as CCEF. Her writing and training focus, it, it, it focuses on training churches, excuse me, to care for those affected by trauma and domestic abuse. And Darby has a brand new book that's being released. It's called Trauma, Caring for Survivors. So it's great to have you here. And just can you just talk to us a little bit about what kinds of traumas you deal with the most and your general passion for helping those with trauma? Yeah, I mean, I really just had focused not intentionally on counseling women in abusive marriages. I had, I was counseling, I was homeschooling mom still one day a week at CCEF and God just kept bringing women in oppressive marriages to me. And so it just really forced me to lean into scripture and try to understand what was happening and wanting to help their churches understand how to minister to them. So that's just driven me to want to write in a way that churches know how to help. It's a very Mm. confusing, domestic abuse is is confusing to try to orient in as a helper. So I've spent a lot of time there, but that's tangentially led me into other traumas, sexual abuse, child sexual abuse, violent crime. Yeah. 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 Awesome. So you've recently written a new book. Can you tell us why you wrote it and how you hope God will use it to bring help and hope to those suffering with trauma or to bring help and hope to those who are dealing with how to help those who are dealing with trauma? Yeah, initially it's a little booklet, so it's short. And I think one of the things that's just been on my heart is that trauma seems to be the buzzword you constantly are hearing is the counselor trauma informed is a church trauma informed and trauma i think in our world is gaining so much mystique or mystery and i kind of just wanted to demystify trauma and say everything we actually need to understand what's happening in the heart of somebody is actually scripture speaks to it really robustly and trauma actually just pushes us to know the person and the word of god better and so i was really hoping to orient people in churches, helpers, leaders, to care well for those in their midst who are dealing with something that has such an upheaval on their lives. Can you just define for us, as you were as you were talking about it, I thought, you know, you said we've said trauma several times in this podcast already, but we haven't really defined what it is. What what how do you define trauma? Yeah, it's not easy to define in a sense. I mean, trauma is a word that we use to talk about the impacts of an event or a series of events on a person. Hmm. So the way I look at it is trauma actually overwhelms a person's ability to cope, to flourish. And so, yeah, we're embodied souls. And so it's going to have impacts on our souls and impacts on our bodies. And when just distress is so great, it actually overwhelms a person. That's how I tend to think about when is something trauma or traumatic. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I've never heard it put that way. So it's when it overwhelms our ability to function Mm -hmm. generally. Yeah, it becomes disruptive, right? It can be disruptive in our relationships. It can be disruptive in our relationship with the Lord. It can disrupt our bodies because we're left with panic attacks, you know, anxiety, PTSD. Just becomes so, the distress becomes just disruptive. What kinds of specific traumas have you seen? Yeah, again, probably what I deal with in the abuse world is probably more of a compound trauma. It's trauma that happens over a series of years by people who are supposed to love you and care for you. So I tend to deal with traumas that are based more relationally and that they occur over time. Have you found that church elder boards, sessions, etc., when they're dealing with a woman who comes to them and says, my husband's abusing me, whether it's emotional abuse or Mm -hmm. physical abuse, what are some of the errors that you've seen or some of the ways that, that, that those boards have been unhelpful? And how do you think they can do a better job? And I say that out of experience because I've experienced it where I've been on elder boards where I have felt that, you know, we didn't do a very good job with these women who come in. 
How can yeah. you speak bluntly? What yeah, have you seen? Yeah. Well, I think How can in, be in def- more helpful? yeah. In defense of churches, often victims come in because there's been they're not doing well, right? They are not presenting a clean story that's linear. They're typically right. more confused. They're not typically saying, I've been emotionally and spiritually and sexually abused by my husband, right? Their speech is more chaotic. It's more circular. They're giving you examples. But you, it's hard as an elder board then to press in and ask for more. So what I've kind of encouraged churches to do is to ask more questions. So victims will come and they'll present a story and just to be curious. Has that ever happened? What's that like? How does, what's the worst time that that's ever happened? Yeah, just be, be curious. Yeah, do you feel afraid of your spouse? So instead of trying to make, take information from only what the victim is initially disclosing, it's actually trying to find out more information. And what we, really typically want, yeah, what we typically want to do as Christians is to solve the problem. We don't want to expand the problem, make it bigger, see more. And abuse is actually, I think, a problem of the imagination because most men who love their wives well, they can't imagine the brutality that's taking place. So they don't even know to ask, did your husband follow you around the house? Has he forced you to have sex? Like that doesn't even occur to ask. So I think you're at a disadvantage. So I, I, I say, take your own lens off of how you would love your wife and really lean in and ask for more details in a sensitive way. That's really great, Darby. That's really helpful. Um, yeah, because a lot of times we just want to find out what the story is. We want to know, he said, she said, okay, what did you do? And this is an awful question to ask a woman who's been abused, but what did you do? What did you do to, to deserve that? You know, that right. kind of thing, which is the worst possible question. But yet it is a valid question because you want to know what the other side of the story is. And, you know, especially when we're talking not about physical abuse, but about emotional abuse, where there's a lot of arguing and a lot of he said, she said. What do you do with a woman who is struggling with forgiveness towards her husband uh, after abuse. Jesus talks about forgiveness. He talks about forgiving your enemies. He says, if you if you don't forgive others, you will not be forgiven. There's so many passages mm-hmm. about that. But yet what I've seen is I've seen women who come in with really difficult, horrible situations where they have, in my opinion, biblical grounds for divorce. But yet there'll be others who will say, but you need to forgive him. Mm-hmm. And then you need to show the fruits of that forgiveness towards him. And how do you separate those those issues and parse those yeah. out? Yeah, that's really difficult because one, I mean, we're always seeking long term to forgive people in the spirit of Christ, right? Whether they deserve it or not, right? But that's different than reestablishing a relationship with someone. So I think what I want people to understand, women who've been living in domestic abuse have hundreds, if not thousands of things to forgive. And mm-hmm. unless their spouse has truly repented, they're going to, even as they're relating and sharing children and going through a separation, there's going to be continual abuse. And so just even recognizing what the reality of that means. Also, too, we think about enemies, and I think of it in the Psalms, right? We pray for our enemies to come to know Jesus, but we also pray for protection from them and that justice would come. And so we have to think about enemies robustly as all of Scripture. So when you're married to an enemy, it's very difficult and I think we instruct victims to pray both ways. We we want our enemies to be saved, but we also want protection from them. So I think just even expanding the categories a bit, right? A, a, a person who chooses to remain in sin in that way, I think it's more helpful to go to the Proverbs actually and think about the fool, right? And so how does scripture tell us to interact with a foolish person? So we, we, we want to be really robust in looking at this. It's, it's much broader than just the marriage categories that people want to put on it. And we can't reconcile with someone who's committing perpetual harm against us. That's not loving for them, actually. It's leaving them well, in a spiritually dangerous spot. What I've seen in the church is I've seen a lot of times the, because let's face it, usually it's men who are on a, an elder board. Um, and... So these men many times have a relationship with the guy and they've just seen one side of him and they've seen the good side. I remember there was once there was a, actually it's happened several times, so I'm not going to be disclosing anything confidential, but there was a leader in the church who was really emotionally abusive towards his, towards his wife. There was no other way around it. 
but he was the sweetest kind of guy, like when you would talk to him and all the, the elders when they would talk to him. And I remember once I was sitting in my office with the two of them, and while he's talking to me, he's being himself, and he's being this sweet, godly man. And then when she would start talking, I would just watch him, and he would turn and look at her with such disdain mm -hmm. that his whole face, his whole countenance changed. And so I would just, I've, I've encouraged people to just watch the yeah. body language even yeah. between the husband and wife. Just watch, watch everything, be observant, be curious. Like you yeah. said, ask questions. Yeah. And really the only person that knows if their spouse has stopped controlling and manipulating them and seeking to dominate them is the spouse, right? They, oppressors are very good with their words. They're very good. They're, they oftentimes can be the best repenters, the biggest crocodile tears. Right. So, yeah. So I've actually written an article. It's in the Journal of Biblical Counseling. It's how to discern repentance when a serious sin occurs. Because I find that churches really need help landing that, what to look for. What is real, mm. what is real godly repentance versus worldly sorrow? That's hard to discern sometimes. And what is it? It's someone who knows that they've sinned against the Lord. It's someone who can name the impacts. Like, I've sinned, and these are the specific ways I've sinned, and this is the specific ways that it's harmed you, right? When someone's genuinely repented of abuse, they almost can't stop making connections. Oh, so last Saturday, oh, so three years ago, when I did this, when I when I did that, you must have been afraid because if once they get it, there's so much to disclose, and, and they, they understand the harm that they've done someone so they stop rushing forgive me take me back they they understand the grace required and so it's no it's no longer about what they need and they turn and actually it's about what their spouse needs and that's good for all of us isn't it just that kind of repentance in everything yeah. even for the non-abusers yeah for sure because <laughs> at some level we're all abusers aren't we I wouldn't say that. I mean, what I, I tend to say it this way is what the core root of abuse is entitlement. And we all struggle with entitlement. Abusers, I, we might do abusive things, right? But uh, what makes someone oppressively, characteristically oppressive in my mind is when they don't have sorrow for their sin, right? They have a blindness to what they're doing and they're perpetually harming someone for their own gain. Our entitlements might sneak out here and there, but if my husband says to me, you know, last night you were really selfish, I typically feel bad. Like, and I want to repair that relationship. Oppressors tend not to be moved by harming other people. So, so we might have moments where we do certain things, but the overall pattern is, is, and the consistency and the perpetualness of it is going to be different. That's interesting because I've often thought about, <clears throat> you know, when, when was the straw that broke the camel's back in this relationship? You know, when was it that a word was said between the two people, an action was done, and <clears throat> so many times it's just that the sun went down on their anger. It was that the abuser, right, just like you said, didn't care enough that they had hurt the person to apologize, to seek forgiveness, to change, and the those who are not abusers are, are the ones who immediately want to repair it you know i my wife and i we've had a a, a rule in our marriage that we don't go to bed without mm. fixing whatever it is that needs to be, needs to be fixed and <clears throat> we haven't had to do that very often where we stay up in fact i don't know that that's ever happened mm -hmm. but every night we go to bed and we're able to hold hands together and we're we're okay and i'm not tooting my own horn there i'm just saying that like that's something that mm -hmm. that we've counseled younger uh, couples with is just don't let the sun go down on your anger and that's right from the scriptures right you you talk about the psalms and uh, shifting gears and thinking yeah. about the, the scriptures and you say that they weren't written in a day and I've never heard it put that way before. And so I wanted to have you expand on that for our listeners. Yeah, I think when we're interacting with sufferers, our yeah. hope is that we want to restore their hope in God. And we have to just recognize that even we can think of David, who's written so many Psalms. You know, he was he was chased by Saul for a decade. And so we're often looking at the fruit of his wrestling before the Lord and he's describing what it was like for him, and he finds resolution towards the end. But I think it's probably taken him more than an hour. Some, maybe some psalms were a few days. I can imagine some were months in the making, where he's really having this conversation with the Lord, and that's the fruit of it. Those, the situations are long, and that fighting for hope and seeing who the Lord is in the midst of suffering 
is is just hard fought. Yeah, we I've read never songs quickly. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, I've never thought of it that way. I've always thought, all right, he sits down, and I'm sure there were psalms like that. Maybe when he reflected back over the entire situation, where he just sits down and writes an entire psalm. But the idea that that psalm evolved in his heart through the Holy Spirit over time is is really powerful. We tell our girls, so we are at a house, we were talking about this before the, the podcast started, that we're at a ministry called Path to Freedom, where we live with girls that are rescued from human trafficking. And one of the things that the therapists teach them to do, and these are secular therapists, and that it's truth, what they teach them to do is to write it out, you know, to write out the trauma and to move that trauma from your right brain that's scattered and artistic and all over the place to the left brain that is more, you know, objective and factual. And seeing them do that and the impact that that has has been so powerful. And it's the same idea with the Psalms, mm -hmm. but to write it out, to write out the promises of God. And that's one of the beautiful things And David Powelson used to teach us this is to personalize a Psalm, right? And so even after they have their story out, to then find a psalm that resonates with them. For sex trafficking victims, it's usually Psalm 55, 56, mm. and 57. And then go through it and personalize, you know, like I would rather fly away. Like I want to be as far away from my body that was ravaged by evil than I possibly mm. can. And to make it really concrete. And it just, it's a beautiful way that the Lord has given us ways to connect with him. Horrors that are just, and things that are so shameful that are hard to speak. It's in there, yeah. That is so good. I'm going to use that with our girls. Thank you for sharing that to fly away so far. Yeah, that's that's pretty awesome. Um, so just I'm just wondering, do you when it comes to that idea of the science behind the brain and the, the right brain and the left brain and writing writing it out, how do you synthesize that biblically and then apply that or do you not? I don't I'm, I don't know. I'm curious when it comes to. So I assume that you're coming more from a biblical counseling methodology with CCEF, but how does the science of it work as well? Well, we just we recognize that we are our souls are housed in bodies, and so when our bodies have been harmed, right? When we're under stress, we know certain things happen in our bodies. There there can be bodily changes. I think where we land is that we also want to be more hopeful. A lot of science or, or secular counseling says, you know, trauma is the biggest shaping influence in your life. Your brain has been changed forever. And I think we would just want to come in and say there might have been changes and there might have been struggles and you might have new limitations or weaknesses now. And yet at the same time, Christ is still the largest shaping influence and there's healing that can happen. And yeah, it's going to take a long time and we're going to honor, we're going to support the body. We might even have to involve the body in some of your care. I think of one woman who is a sexual abuse survivor in her marriage. She she really healed by doing a lot of karate, and that was just incorporating the right and the left side of the brain, getting some of that energy out, and she made great gains. I can think of other women who have counseling, and they've been sketching while I've been counseling them. They have something else to be doing with their hands. And so we want to be wise and incorporate those things, but again, we just trust what the Lord is up to in the midst of that. That's awesome. It's awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Darby. Uh, those of you who are watching and listening, I am just so impressed with what I am hearing and the way that Darby, the way that you are able to synthesize, which is just like you just did, uh, the body and the soul. I've never heard it put that way. Uh, that was pretty, pretty awesome. And so those of you who are suffering with trauma, I want to highly recommend Darby Strickland and her books. Those of you who are in churches and you're trying to work through how do we run the church and do everything that we're doing. And also when these church discipline cases come to us that are so difficult, how do we sift through all of that? I want you to go to Darby's resources. She's obviously has the Lord is on is on your ministry, Darby. So it's been great to have you here. And is there anything you want to share at the end? No, I just appreciate your ministry. And, and just I think it's just the encouragement that when we're looking at trauma, whether we're a helper or we're a sufferer, it's tempted to be overwhelmed. And just to really ask the Lord, like, Lord, if I'm a helper, I know that you're going to help me help. And Lord, if I'm a sufferer, I'm afraid to even ask you, but just be brave enough to say to the Lord, help me. Because it is overwhelming. So I want, I want to just encourage people on both ends. The Lord is on their side. 
What I love about you and about your ministry and about your methodology is that it all comes back to the Word of God. It all comes back to the Word of God and what's in the Scriptures because there's so much that's being said to those who are in trauma. It might be good things to be said or maybe not. And But many times when I've heard when, when things of the Lord are being said to girls victimized by uh, human trafficking, so many times it's it's emotionalism, it's just false, you know, false doctrine, those types of things, and it's so unhelpful to them. Uh, but it all comes back to the Word. My mom would say this a lot, is she would challenge me, what does the Word of God say about this situation in my life? That that echoes in my ear all the time. Um, what does the what does God's Word say? And that's what I hear from you, and that's what I really appreciate about yeah, what you're doing. Thank you. And God's Word lets us be messy, dependent people. I guess that's yes. what, yes. yes. Yeah, Amen. Well, on that note, we're going to close. It's been great to have you with us, Darby. And my name is Chuck Betters, and this is Mark Ake Ministries, the Help and Hope podcast. And I pray that this has been helpful to you. May God bless you.